Hello, it's M2 the Games. I know I haven't made a video in a while, but you know I'm just making one today because I'm bored and I thought, you know, these tips and tricks would really be helpful. Um, so yeah, this is going to be a tips and tricks video of the best tips and tricks I could think of for Terraria. So in this video, I'm actually going to include a ranking in the bottom right corner to show you how likely I think you are to know the tip that's being presented. So this rankings are going to be from common to legendary, with common meaning that you would likely know this tip or more likely know it, and uncommon meaning that you would kind of know it. Rare would be like you, not many people know it. Epic means a lot of people don't know this, and legendary meaning barely any people know this. And also, I put a lot of effort into this, so if one of the tips you don't know, just please feel free to skip ahead and find out there. Alright, so as you can see here, I'm in a mine and it's completely dark. Now, of course, I can use the Terra Blade to light it up. And as you can see, this Terra Blade is actually letting me somewhat see through the walls to get a sense of where other caves might be. But this isn't nearly as good as the Star Fury. Watch this. So I'm swinging it at the walls and look at what the stars are doing. They're falling through where caves are. And look at that. It just revealed so much. So I know there's a big cave up here and now I might use this to um, dig up this way and just I, I'll just keep using this to find new caves like while I'm exploring caves I'll just be swinging my stir fury oh look there's a cave up here I'm gonna go up to this right, so the next tip is a bit more well known but it is actually um, I'm actually gonna add something to this tip that a lot of people actually didn't know and this will actually help them from confusion so um, as you can see, this and this actually has to do with the uh, finding star furies, so this could help you with the um, previous tip. You see these puddles right here? These puddles look like unnatural, right? Like normally water spawns and okay, I don't have any good examples nearby, but like natural forms. But this just looks like it fell from the sky and got caught in these crevices, right? Well, if you see something like this, a lot of, most of the time when you build up, you will actually find a sky island. So this is a world that I already had for a while, so the sky island's been wrecked by my bridge. But basically, sky island will help you find skyware chests. Now here's something, part of this advice that you actually haven't seen, and it's the jungle. Now be aware of searching the jungle, because the jungle's actually full of things that look like this, like water, when, okay, so this one actually does have a sky island above, but it's not directly above. And the reason that you actually find water on the ground that shows the skylines above is because the water from the generations of the skylines, when, when generating, it falls down. So this water right here couldn't possibly be of that type because it is off from the actual tower. And so this could mislead someone to not find it. Or like, this, this basically the jungle is full of small little water pockets and so they're never actually going to tell you whether or not there's a sky island above. So just everywhere but the jungle you should find this tip effective all right the next piece of advice is the the use of pink slime now what is pink slime well it is a slime dropped by the rare slime named pinky um it'll you'll probably find it during the slime festival or whatever it is all right i'm gonna go open this crafting menu and what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna craft pink torches so i'm gonna get a few pink torches craft those all right so basically after crafting the pink torches you're gonna want to grab either some gold or platinum so I got four gold right here so I'm just gonna use that and then you go to your crafting menu and you find the peace candle alright so here it is right here peace candle boom boom I just crafted two of them and what this basically does is when you place it down it gives you the peace candle um, buff and it's decreased monster spawn rate now why is this so useful a lot of people overlook this, but it's actually insanely useful. So I'm going to show you some examples of when this was useful. So you get tons of pink gel when killing pink slimes. You have a ton of excess. You can make tons of these candles. Just the only limiting reagent is really um, platinum or gold, because it does take platinum two platinum or gold bars each time. But as you can see along my arena track that I use to fight um, daytime Empress of Light, I put peace candles every once in a while. Now, the reason I did this is while I'm running, I don't want to like have to bump in to something that could harm me. Around builds, I have a build right here. I have a cool build right here. I put peace candles around and then a ton of mobs just don't end up spawning and it's just a lifesaver. It really does prevent a lot. All right, the next piece of advice is pretty simple, but it's basically bubble blocks and honey. I know you're probably like, what? Some, a lot of players do know what this means. And of course there's different approaches to this, but I'm just gonna show you what I mean. So first you wanna you need to have access to the party girl 
and I do believe that she only sells bubble blocks past a certain part of the game. I'm pretty sure it's the wall of flesh. Um, just basically, you're not going to be able to use this with bubble blocks as soon until you want, she unlocks this in her shop. But basically, you can buy bubble blocks from her, and what you can do with them is very useful, especially in arenas. All right, so here we're in my Duke Fishron arena. It's kind of lackluster. Like you got, what, like what is even is this? This is to give you the flower buff. But right here we have the bubble blocks surrounding the honey. So it's as simple as just, you know, placing a circle and honey. While you're in your arena and you run through it, assuming you have like a faster running gear, it's more fast. But this just gave me the honey life regeneration in is increased buff. All right, the next tip is similar, but it is absolutely broken. I don't think people actually know how insane this is. This is what beat me Moon Lord. This is literally the only reason, not the only reason, but it is the main reason I beat Moon Lord. All right, so using the Shrimpy Truffle Mount dropped as an expert mode item from Duke Fishron. So if you don't play expert mode, skip this, but if you ever consider want to consider it, you should do it. So it's an infinite flight mount that is, it's pretty fast, but it's not that fast. What is its advantage is when you put it in water like substances that aren't lava, right? So I go in water, his eyes glow, and now he goes insanely fast. It's it's insane. Like I use this to get around Moon Lord, but this isn't it, right? Because water doesn't heal you like honey does. So what I do in the middle of my Duke Fish on Arena is I do these giant honey columns. As you can see, I filled this column of bubble blocks and honey. And what I do is I encircle Duke Fishron during a fight, and he just doesn't get to touch me barely at all because I'm just moving so quick on this mount. Um, and not only that, I'm getting the honey life regeneration buff. Like, that is insane. So with this mount, this is the best mount in the game using this strategy. It is absolutely insane. Another thing you can do is if you want to have more movement and not have to build this um, advanced thing of honey, well, first of all, you could get the Bottomless Honey Bucket, which is a drop from the Fisherman quests, um, which gives you unlimited honey. Or you could actually wait to fight like bosses when it's raining, because this buff will be activated on the Duke Fishron mount when it is raining. So that is incredibly useful. Okay, the next piece of advice, a good bit of people do know, but I do think there's still going to be a lot of people who don't know this. So I'm actually going to fight Gollum. All right, so I'm going to let Gollum like beat me up a bit, become half health. Okay, I'm look, I'm below half health, right? Using the godly vampire knives, throw it at Gollum, boom, 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 boom. In a matter of seconds, I am back to full health. Look at that. This is insane. And look, I'm going to switch classes too. I am now in nebula armor, almost half health. Look at this. Very effective. Of course, it is a lot more effective when wearing uh, a melee set. Like, look at this. They're just coming out so much faster and it's a lot better. I'm healing faster. So I would actually recommend if you're going to take advantage of the vampire knives to have a at least one melee set to switch to in your um, armor slots. But this is just truly insane. Like this is just unlimited healing. Like it's actually insane how quickly you heal and there's no limit on this whatsoever. No item in the game offers this much healing. It is absolutely broken. It needs to be fixed. Oh, Eye of Gollum, that's luck. Wow. So yeah, I definitely recommend always using the Vampire Knives, no matter what setup you are. And you're probably wondering, how do you get these? Well, it is actually a dungeon chest drop that you can get after Plantera. And it's basically, it's from the Crimson. A lot of people are like, oh man, I play Corruption. But that should not stop you. Like, All right, the next piece of advice is, I know a barely any people know about like this is a legendary piece of advice it's basically you're going to want a bunch of stone blocks and you're gonna want ecto mist now what is ecto mist it's basically when there's a lot of tombstones around mist will form on the ground as you can see right here there's mist and you need to be in this mist for it to work and you will need a heavy workbench so um, i'm gonna place it here and as you can see here Oh wait, bouncy boulder? That's actually kind of cool. Okay, I'm crafting one of these for fun. You can craft a ton of boulders here, so let's just do that. I'm going to turn a bunch of the stone I got. Six stone for one boulder, and what am I going to do with these boulders? Well, I'm going to turn them into boulder statues. I don't know why I'm struggling to find... Okay, I'm struggling to find the boulder recipe. Maybe the ecto mist I'm in isn't as potent as the game wants it to be, so you do need it to be 
to a certain extent. So I will place some more gravestones over near it. Yeah, each time I place a tombstone, the world gets darker and it's like weird. Alright, yeah, now I can craft it and oh wait, rolling cactus? I'm gonna craft that for fun. That's pretty cool. Day Hayden? Okay. Okay, but basically here I'm crafting a boulder statue. Just a few of those and it costs 50 stone and 5 boulders which is roughly 80 stone because each boulder takes um, 6 stone to make. So yeah, 8 boulder statues. Now why is this so useful? Well, it is insanely good against getting extra DPS especially during events and it's insane against the destroyer and I'm just going to show you. Alright, so here's the first example. I can hook it up to an electronic and look, these boulders are rolling down and this is my arena where I can fight raid events. The boulders get stopped by that, and this just helps me deal with the enemies, like, every couple seconds. Every once in a while. There's a cooldown. It'll send all these boulders rolling down to help do damage to all the enemies. Um, it will also damage you, though. That is a downside. So this is my setup I had for when I actually fought the destroyer. So as you can see right here, I got a ton of boulders on the ground, and I got a nice opening right over here. For me to shoot my Daedalus Stormbow Holy Arrows through. So I'd flick this lever and watch what happens. All the boulders would fall. Every time these boulders would fall during the fight, a ton of damage was done to the destroyer. And so that just helped me a lot, right? The destroyer is down on the ground while I'm up here shooting Daedalus Arrows down and boulders down, which will continue to hit it as the boulders roll around on the ground. But of course, you got to make sure this, you're, of course, the probes are still going to be a huge issue to deal with. But this just makes the destroyer a whole lot easy, and it makes a lot of bosses easy. Like the next piece of advice is to make use of the star cannon. Yeah, literally the star cannon is insane. The star shooter or whatever. Um, of course, this is the upgraded version. Um, there is an easier version to make that I believe you can make pre-mech. I'll have a photo of that on screen. But let's go test this out against Gollum. Of course, there is a huge downside to this. You need to save up stars, and this thing shoots stars like crazy. Look at that. Boom, 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 boom. Each one of those is a star that I'm losing. You definitely want to save up stars, but look at this. I'm wearing a melee setup, and that's crazy damage I'm doing against Gollum, right? Especially if you can line it up. This is the best against a destroyer, because if you can get it lined up to pierce all of its segments, it is absolutely insane. This is the thing that actually got me through Plantera. It literally carried me in the fight, but the flamethrower also carried me too. But that'll I'll discuss like the most underrated weapons later on. But yeah, basically, Star Cannon, all variants are insanely underrated, and you want to take advantage of that item. Alright, the next piece of advice is a bit odd. No one gives this credit, right? You're trying to make the mini shark or mega shark, and you're struggling, because you don't have enough shark fins. I have been on FaceTimes with friends, I've been playing Terraria with them in Worlds, and they're just spending forever trying to find an opportunity to get the shark fins for the mega shark. It's like... For some reason, the weirdest ingredients, the shark fin, is the hardest because it's basically the RNG to get one of these to spawn. But look no further because now we have shark statues. Now you can hook this up easily. And when you flick the switch here, now boom, I got sharks spawning in. Let's see how quickly I'll get shark fin. There we go, shark fin. Easy as that. And there's plenty of insane. Three shark fins, man? That feels kind of lucky. I already have 11 from when I. Okay, and you can find shark statues just underground in random buildings, and you just should not be ignoring statues underground. Like, if you see a statue, you need to think, okay, what do I know about the statue? Could this be useful? Because some statues are insanely useful, some statues aren't. What I do is I just kind of collect all of them, and then if I find I ever need any of them, I'll use them. Like, I have a ton of statues here and here. Yeah, I know, nerd emoji. But a lot of people say you need to defeat at least one mech boss before the mechanic moves in, and you can get such electronic devices and to that I say that's just not true because you can actually use underground electronics to use these sh the shark statue effectively and the most easy example of this I could think of would be the dungeon so I'm held I'm holding an item related to technology to to wiring and stuff in this game I got the grand design you can hold something like a dart trap oh yeah right here technology right here so yeah we have a this is very I don't know if this is low enough where Skeletron would hit you. Your dungeon may or may not spawn with a switch like this, but you could also use underground pressure plates. As you can see, I flick the switch and it activates, it sends a signal. So what I can actually do is 
using my shark statue, and this works for any statues. Oh wait, no, the shark doesn't have enough room to spawn. Okay, remember, that is a thing that happens. I swear to God, game, this, let me play this game. But look, I'm flicking the switch. I didn't need any technology for this except for one to hold to find the switch. And look at that, shark fins galore. This works for any statue. Um, just take advantage of already existing wiring systems. You don't need the mechanic to do machinery. That's the truth. The next piece of advice is another piece of statue advice, but I can guarantee you this is the most important statue advice you will ever hear. Now, basically, when you're in a cave and you see a certain statue type, you need to pick it up. Like, I'm not saying you might, but you literally need to. Now, what statue types are these? Well, there are mana and heart statues. Now, let me explain why these are so important. So, I'm running down my arena right here. Here's the Duke Fishron mount section with the honey. All right, so right here, we have a star statue that I found. And, of course, if you go along the way, there's a heart statue. Now, what I've done is I've lined this entire arena with... Um, mana and heart statues now this is insanely important because if you can hook it up to a wiring system that like repeats it will generate stars hearts stars and hearts mana and hearts and I just flick the switch and now these things should be spawning hearts and mana all right yeah right there you just saw a star pop out of that and if I go in here it will get mana oh yeah see this one made a heart okay I do think there's a limit on how many you can have spawned like in your world at once like artificially I, I'm not gonna read up on that because I don't oh yeah you just saw that okay that was in slow-mo put that in slow-mo but this one just spawned a heart but basically yeah you're getting heart and mana it's very broken and useful just collect heart statues and mana statues all right next piece of advice is kind of widespread the rainbow gun and the nimbus rod now these are very prominent weapons because not because you actually have to like constantly use them during a fight you can usually just put them up like once or twice or three times or something and they will stay there so yeah see put two nimbus through okay two nimbus rod clouds up and it's shooting raindrops down and you can use the rainbow gun and it'll hold a rainbow there for a good bit of time so i'm gonna use it on golem right now nimbus rod nimbus rod and let's see it'll just do some extra damage to him like he spawns in look at that the rain's pouring on him if i can keep him in the radius of the, these weapons it'll just continue to do damage like i'm doing i don't have a minion i don't have nothing else damaging him except the rainbow gun and the nimbus rod and it's like 800 damage per second like okay but yeah you understand the point nimbus rod and rainbow gun are absolutely insane golem trophy i'll take that and you get the nimbus rod by killing the angry nimbuses i just killed one it's a pretty rare drop <laughs> Let's see how much damage the sentries can do. Okay, they're they're missing a bit, but if I can keep Gollum like kind of near them, right? Yeah. Okay, we're getting like a good 300 damage per se second. Um, but like, oh yeah, we get some piercing damage and it spikes up a bit. Okay, we're up to 500, 600. Yeah, like if you can get the right angles, very useful. The message is overall use sentries no matter what stage you are in the game. They will do some damage if any. All right, the next piece of advice I can guarantee you, nobody knows. No one knows this. This is so weird. If you know this, or some people will know the use of this item, but they'll never think to use it in this way. When you don't have a flying mount with infinite flight, it's often really hard to reach high up areas, especially in the early game when you want to reach the sky islands. So let's pretend I want to reach the Sky Island, but I don't want to waste too much time building up over and over again with spamming blocks and getting shot down by monsters. I want to do it quickly, even though I don't have like an insane flying mount. All right, so we're back at where we were earlier, where we see these puddles and we know there's going to be a Sky Island above. And what we're going to use is the Snake Charmer's Flute. Now what this does is it summons a rope that goes up 80 blocks and then stops. So we're gonna climb this thing. It has like 25 seconds until it goes away, I believe. So climb up, and you wanna make sure you have a building block of any type. Then you place the building block, and then you go onto the building block, and then you just place another Snake Charmer's Flute. 
and then you can go up again. This is, look at that, Sky Island already. That is absolutely insane at reaching the sky. Now, how do you get the Snake Charmer's Flute? Well, in the underground sandstone biome, you have a 15, 14.5% chance, I believe, of getting one of these. Um, and you could also get them from any sort of desert crate, um, um, ocean, like, mirage thing, oasis mirage, or whatever it's called. This Snake Charmer's Flute is insane. It is just an on-the-go, easy-to-place rope. Like, look at that insane and you can place blocks on it i think yeah you can place blocks anywhere on it this is an insane tip now of course the desert can be overwhelming i must admit especially early game but a lot of people still go in there anyway to get items like the ancient chisel for 25 percent mining speed and it's just full of insane items right you can even collect the ancient you can even collect the ancient fossil oh gold ladybug is that it? <gasps> Yo, gold ladybug. That's insane. What is my luck this video? If you guys don't know, I'm literally collecting all the gold bugs. And this game has been very generous. So as you can see over here I, is my gold bug collection. This next piece of advice is kind of weird. Uh, teleportation potions. You want to always use them. This is kind of obvious. I got seven right here. Let's start drinking them. Look, it just took me to a Sky Island. You see that? I drank one to the Sky Island. I can't tell you how often these things take you to the Sky Island. I don't know how the programming works for these things, but I'm pretty sure there's some sort of weird preference that makes it more likely to go to a Sky Island. So I'm going to drink another one. And here I am in the underground jungle. Um, this is extremely useful because it will always take time and be a, somewhat of a hassle to find caves you haven't found before. But this just removes that. It'll just take you to somewhere random a lot of times. So of course, it will take you to places you've already found, um, like this, but I have found so much of this massive world, it's not even funny. But yeah, look, look, new place. I've never been here before. This is just a new area where I am free to start digging and find some treasure. Look at this strange plant. Strange plant right there. This proof that teleportation potions are the goat. The next piece of advice is very oddly specific, but you need to know this, and it's to not sell certain items. Now, I made the huge mistake of selling a bunch of items I got early in the game for gold, but now, as you can see by my piggy bank, it is not a problem anymore. 230 platinum coins, and I can literally get infinite platinum coins. I don't know why in the world I was so concerned about cash back then, because um, I sold some crazy rare items that I don't didn't realize were rare. Now, the two items I sold, the first one was the Living Loom. Now, a lot of you will get this, but it's actually not a guaranteed drop. It is found in the living wood trees and it is in the underground section. If you sell, see the two gold price tag on this thing and sell it, I can tell you, you're an idiot. This thing has a bunch of unique crafting recipes. And if you want to become a builder later in the game, you're going to need one of these. And especially if you're not allowing yourself to use different worlds like I am, you're not going to be, be able to use any living loom things unless you find it in underground houses which is what i had to do to make my living wood house i had to find underground furniture instead of just crafting it the normal way through the loom so don't sell stuff right if you don't understand it maybe research it and find out how rare it is the next thing i sold was the seaweed i don't think people realize how rare seaweed is in this game but it summons a pet turtle and what it basically is is a two percent drop i believe from jungle tree like living mahogany chest i think that's how you pronounce it and it's just a 2% drop. It's extremely rare in a, from an extremely rare chest. And I had one, but I just decided to sell it because it was worth like two gold. And now I regret that because I'm now like trophy hunting, right? I got all these rare pets here. The amber, um, I got the spider egg. I got the banana ring, right? We got the uh, this thing, the stellar tune. All right, the next tip is how underrated the witch's broomstick is. This thing is a drop from the pumpkin moon, and it is so great. Now, the reason why it's so great is, I'm just gonna show you in comparison to other ones, it is a lot faster, right? Look at the shrimpy truffle, right? It doesn't fit through a three block hole. It has to be at least four block. And when it's touching the ground, it like goes really slow. A lot of mounts act like this, or they big and clunky and take up the screen. And they're just not, why they're enchanted night crawlers? What the, bro? While the broomstick, is way better. First of all, look how quick I'm moving with little effort. I do believe this is the quickest 
infinite flight mount. It fits through three block gaps, so useful. Definitely what I'd recommend if you're like a builder or anything. Yeah, objectively the best mount. And um, I will be deleting any comment that disagrees. All right, the next piece of advice is to always buy these four items from the traveling merchant. Now, I didn't buy these items when I first saw them. And then I went on to regret it because I wanted to craft a useful item. There's an item called the Architect Gizmo Pack, and it's an insanely useful item that combines a bunch of building accessories to, into one. And you can even combine it even more to eventually get, it eventually crafts the Hand of Creation when combined with more items. But basically what I'm saying is the Architect Gizmo Pack can only be crafted from traveling merchant items. Now I'm going to list those three items. There's the Brick Layer, the Extendo Grip, the Paint Sprayer, and the Portable Cement Mixer. Now, of course, these items vary in price from 5 gold to 10 gold, but always buy them. Even when you think you don't need them, always buy them because eventually you might want to craft one of these and you will want to have a building sidekick that will help you have placement speed, um, through plus 3 range, increased item pickup. It's just very good. By the way, look at this uh, epic gnome house I made. Very cool. We got the gnomes in their little gnome home living under my house this masterpiece but yeah that's it that's the whole video i haven't uploaded in a while and if you like this video please make sure to leave a comment or like um i do i would like to make another one of these videos maybe if this one does well um so maybe leave a comment saying what you want to see in another one of these videos where i give tips and tricks and advice and maybe share which ones you did know or which ones you didn't know or how true some of these are because i think most of them are true maybe i'm wrong though if this video does well I will be making a guide to the most underrated weapons and and I will be making a guide to the rarest pets and items in Terraria because I feel like a lot of guides are just like YouTube shorts that'll just spend like 60 seconds talking about like two or three items. I will actually go in depth and talk about the all the, all the many different rare items like the rain song or whatever. If you enjoyed this video, goodbye and I'll see you in um, Ohio. Ah, yeah, yeah.